Um, so as I, I actually, I will admit, this is a talk I, I, I've repackaged a number of times. Originally, I gave it to a, a group of Barnard alums, and so it's not exactly I'll give you the same version as I, as I gave to them. But I had written out an introduction trying to uh, explain the nature of this research and its significance. You know, I there's sort of two perspectives on economic history and historical studies, especially in an economics context. One is just, you know, that's actually as an advisor of mine once put it, he said, you know, for economists, history is a foreign country. It's sort of going there and you, you just revel in the exotica. Oh, look what they did back then, and isn't that interesting or isn't that quaint? And I will say there is an aspect of this research where you look and you say, my God, I can't believe, you know, that's exactly how even what were considered relatively advanced economies operated because the institutions seemed rather peculiar, although I'd like to suggest maybe not as peculiar as, in, as we imagine. And then there's another perspective we often take, and that is thinking of the lessons of history. So I will say, again, there's a little bit of the foreign country tour here. You know, what did the American monetary banking system look like in the 19th century? Um, and again, America is something, ex uh, the United States is exceptional um, in lots of ways, but one in particular is that it, it suffered bank panics with, you know, unbelievable regularity. Um, up to 1914. Um, most countries, bank panics were a thing of the past by the 1870s or 80s, but the United States, every decade there's a major panic, and there are at least two minor panics as well. So really on the order of every, you know, every couple of years, there would be something like a banking panic affecting the country. So, so again, thinking about the lessons of history, there are two issues that I thought, you know, we just didn't need to address very much. Um, you know, again, when I started teaching, these were settled matters. And the first one is, you know, should we go back to the gold standard, right? So you hear this. Actually, there was um, a member of the Virginia State Legislature who actually wanted to secede from the dollar, the paper dollar fiat, paper dollar monetary union, and have, peop have Virginia mint its own coins, gold coins, and they would circulate as an alternative money. Now, of course, you know, it didn't go anywhere, but again, th that the talk is in the air about you know the criticism of the Fed and the and the question is, really, do we need a central bank? Um, and in fact, that's part of you know the, the sort of tale that we tell in this analysis is, is why after the panic of 1907, why did Congress finally enact legislation? It's called the Aldrich Vreeland Act that really set the stage for drafting a blueprint of the Federal Reserve and then ultimately for its adoption, you know, at the end of 1913. So the Fed celebrates, you know, you could date it either way, you know, this looks like the, you know, an anniversary, um, of, you know, centenary of at least the Fed's formal existence, although legislatively the law was actually passed in 1913. So, you know, the question is, you know, what light can we shed on this, you know, the timing, because the United States had had many serious banking panics in 1873, 1884, uh, 1893, you know, again, so why 1907? What was different about 1907? Um, and again, it's, it's, I want to make clear, it wasn't as if there was not a central bank in the United States prior to that. I will use the terminology monetary authority. And monetary authority, we really think of some institutions that have some responsibility for the money supply and regulating essentially money in all of its dimensions, units of account money, transactions money, and so forth and so on. So prior to 1914, there are actually multiple monetary authorities. Um, the Treasury, for example, functions like a monetary authority. State governments, to some degree, have, you know, are, are, have influence over monetary policy. Um, and also there were private joint ventures called clearinghouses, which also exercise today we would think of as central bank functions. So there's a multiplicity of monetary authorities, actually. So that's really the question. It's not do you have a monetary authority or not. It's really what kind of monetary authority. So that's the first issue. And we're trying to make an argument that you probably need a central, centralized monetary authority with considerable power. Some review it as, view it as market, I mean, monopoly power over money matters. Um, and I'll try to explain why. And that's a related, there sort of raises the related question, which is um, about the money supply itself. Uh, up until 1863, the United States uh, also conducted another experiment in what we might call multiple monies. And so you actually had thousands of individual currencies circulating throughout the country. 
So if you were a wholesaler in New York City and you had uh, some transactions with you know, wholesalers in other cities throughout the country, you could see on a daily basis currencies issued by private banks, chartered by their state governments, and they would pass across your desk and you would have to figure out what these monies were worth. Right? So we'd have this kind of private, it's a private but regulated you know, monetary uh, system. Eventually we go to a common currency, 1863 is the kind of common currency law. And so again, we're sort of looking at the experience of the United States with a common currency, finally, but without a, cent you know, a centralized central bank, so to speak. So that's what this, this analysis um, uh, focuses on. And you know, what we'll see, and again, the relevance here, again, not just because of the questioning about the Fed, but I mean, I guess I, I couldn't even have said this probably the last time I gave this talk because Bitcoins hadn't really reached <laughs> the level. But I mean, Bitcoins is actually a, you know, this is, you know, what's the movie, um, uh, the, you know, well, it's not a deja, it's not quite deja vu all over again, but it's this movie where the guy goes back in time, you know, to, you know, forget it. It's too long. <laughs> yeah, back to the future, back to the future, right? So we're going back a little bit, this could be back to the future. And I will say, you know, the U.S. experience with these multiple currencies, these banknote monies, um, many of my colleagues believe that that's actually the right economic model to think about digital monies issued by, you know, kind of private, these private organizations. So with that said and done, um, let me begin, I mean, I actually title, this is my little provocative title, I'll try to catch your, you know, attention, which is Wall Street, Main Street. So, you know, the Wall Street, Main Street um, dichotomy, actually, this runs throughout American history. You know, there's sort of any number of co political economic conflicts over the concerns about centralized financial power in the United States going back to the founding of the country, notably during the pre-Civil War period over these so-called you know, national banks, first and second bank of the United States. Um, it comes up again you know, during the Gilded Age, beginning in the 1890s, early 1900s. 1907 is particularly interesting and kind of relevant, and let me just show you a picture, forget about all this stuff, let me just... So, again, just to kind of illustrate, 190, so this is, okay, so we've got two graphs uh, uh, here. One is very familiar, just tracking um, uh, uh, income inequality in the U.S. So that's, this has probably been, you know, the most widely seen now, you know, uh, graph uh, coming out of any economics research, uh, you know, as of recent. Um, let me just say a few little matters, just since I do have an interest in, and sort of, again, the question about, you know, empirical analysis and sources of data. You know, why does this start in 1917? And the answer is that um, it's based on um, IRS data, essentially, or the equivalent of IRS data, because we really don't have information about the personal distribution of income for the entire population. And in fact, this is not even based on that as well, because the early income tax was exclusively levied on the, you know, the wealthiest, the highest income Americans. Um, and it was used to fund, uh, uh, to pay off the debts of uh, World War I. So this is really what we think of as the top 10% income, which we know from the IRS data, relative to estimates of what the you know, personal income is for the rest of the household sector. And so again, we see towards the end, this sort of the 1907 period here, but also around here, we see this, on one hand, the, you know, the peak of income inequality in the United States, it declines and eventually is it's now back up and might even be larger than it was in the pre-Great um, uh, pre Depression era. This other one is actually a little bit less well known. This is the relative size of the financial sector. Right? So it's sort of looking at the share of the financial sector in GDP. Um, and again, you can see that it has a bit of a similar shape to it. It actually peaks, you know, again, when I think of this as the end of this you know, Gilded Age, uh, first Gilded Age era declines sharply, remains relatively stable, and then in the 1970s starts to increase. So part of the, you know, this Wall Street Main Street is that you know, we've experienced quite a bit of economic growth uh, over the past couple of decades, but that growth has been relatively unequally <coughs> distributed disproportionately right, to in the income distribution to the top 10%, top especially 1%. But that also corresponds to the fact that we see in really an, um, a, a huge increase in the relative size of the financial sector. So again, you're looking at an increase from looks like 4% of GDP to close to 8%. It's a relative doubling in the size of that sector. And you know, at its peak, and again, you may not be aware of this, this is just the share of profits of the financial sector 
in the total corporate business sector. And you can see this is 40%. At its peak before the 2008 crisis, the financial sector earned <coughs> about 40% of all corporate profits. It's really just astonishingly large. And again, as a sector, as a sector. Last time I remember seeing something along these lines was during the 1970s oil price shock when the oil refining companies were earning huge windfall profits. And again, you saw this kind of huge surge in their uh, profits relative to the rest of the business sector. So that's one element of this. But that's not the only way we tend to think about the Wall Street Main Street dichotomy. It's a little bit like you know, Wall Street sneezes and the rest of the economy catches pneumonia. Is, uh, and so that's a little bit how we think of the 2008 crisis, that there was sort of a financial panic on Wall Street because of a variety of risky speculative ventures by, you know, investment and related banks. And then that uh, resulted in not just a national, you know, a kind of a cataclysmic downturn, but really a global downturn. And what I'd like to suggest is that 1907 is exactly the same. It parallels that. And so we try to think about what are relevant historical precedents to 2008. Um, in certain ways, 1907 is, is the appropriate panic because it's, well, in the literature, sometimes thought of as the rich man's panic. It begins because of a variety of speculative activities on Wall Street. There's a shadow banking sector, trust companies involved. You know, the shadow banks, there sort of runs on the shadow banks. Next thing you know, the banking sector collapses, and then the, the economy temporarily collapses. That all sounds very familiar. So that part's the same. I will say there is an important difference here, and that is the economy, the real sector, rebounds relatively quickly from the panic, you know, trough. And that's, of course, unlike today. And part of that is because there wasn't this, you know, think of this huge debt overhang that's aff afflicting us at this moment. So, oops, I, got a, I have to watch it quick on the draw here. So again, you see, you know, again, back then, 1907 is back then. You know, again, this similar pattern, increasing relative size, the financial sector, lots of inequality. And again, this episode, these rich man's panics, um, 73, 1907. By the way, I just, I, for, you know, uh, 19, 1893, I mentioned that, is not the same. 1893, that one starts off in the West and spreads to the East and then rebounds back to the you know, rest of the country. So that's sort of, that is different. Uh, but 73, a lot of speculation of railroad stocks. 1907, um, again, this is a different form of speculation. It's really tied to, starts off with an attempt to um, corner commodities markets. It involves individuals associated with shadow banks. And again, that's what leads to this uh, panic. So, Again, lessons, um, again, there's a, quite a bit of, we might think of banking, financial centralization during this period. Um, so what we work on, my colleague and I, by the way, I should say this is all joint work with a colleague, John James, at the University of Virginia. So what James and I have been studying is actually on the banking side and the monetary side of, of New York's pivotal role um, in, the, in the national and increasingly international banking financial system. So you could think of, we think of New York as the, you know, as the money center. And in this case, we literally mean it is the money center. And what we mean by that and what really, when we think about that carefully, what that implies is that it is the central node of the, okay, here's the terminology. It's an interbank funds network. This is the network that moves money between the banks. And again, if you think about it, this is, you know, we sometimes say money is the grease of the wheels of commerce. But what we really mean is that the banking system, the network, you know, that's what, you know, moves money through the wheels of commerce. And in the pre-Federal Reserve period, this network was essentially organized spontaneously, okay, not consciously, but spontaneously organized um, through private banks. And New York winds up being the pivotal node. So you can see this was um, part of Julie's handiwork at the time. So, you know, basically it's a, it's a kind of schematic representation of how this network functions. And if I can do this... So here's New York as the central node, and then you have a bunch of regional nodes, Boston, Chicago, St. Paul, Minneapolis. By the way, all those regional nodes are typically sort of the sites of Federal Reserve Banks today. In a sense, what the Federal Reserve does is institutionalize this private interbank network, um, uh, St. Louis, New Orleans. So essentially, these nodes, like Chicago, you know, move money around their, we might call hinterland or market area. And then to move money between regions, 
basically you think, well, they would just ship to each other, but instead what they do is these banks hold funds in New York. And then they just write what are called drafts, but just checks. They write bank checks on their New York funds to essentially move money between each other. And so the way that money moves around is essentially through ledger entries in the bank accounts of banks throughout the country on the books of their New York correspondent bank. Right? So New York is that banking center. It's basically holding all of the key, what we call clearing reserves. These are not required reserves. So they hold some of the required reserves, but the clearing reserves are really the reserves that are used to essentially um, to fund the outlays uh, through check or related transactions. So New York banks are holding disproportionate shares of those. And especially their key role is mediating you know, the interregional payments between these regional hubs, which in turn are then organizing the interregional transaction. So in a sense, New York really is the glue that, uh, or the linchpin of this entire system. Um, by the way, we characterize this just using some network terminology. This is what's referred to as a sparse network. And what it means to be a sparse network is that you, know, you only need a few steps to get from one place to the other because of the centralization in the network. So this is highly efficient, actually. Um, and what's striking is that when the Federal Reserve takes over and centralizes entirely, um, this system moves money about as efficiently, really, as the Fed did, with one exception, and that was the Fed was able to adopt a telegraphic wire transfer system that this system is incapable of. And it's, again, it's an interesting story about the nature of the U.S. banking system. Um, but that's the only reason why the Fed was able to achieve certain efficiencies, um, because they were able to consolidate and use, by the way, the Fed wire, that's the terminology we give to the Fed's interbank network. That's a historical anachronism referring to literally the telegraphic wire system that was, um, you know, put in place in 1918. Yeah, question. What about the last place? Yeah, you actually uh, certainly. We just first we just left it to this place. It goes all the way out to San Francisco, and um, and so again, you're talking about you know in terms of number of days. We um, uh, James and I have a paper, I guess the Journal of Money Credit and Banking, in which we actually have tables to show you that New York Clearinghouse made estimates of how long it takes to clear and settle, to move these, you know, move money, you know, various locations. I can't remember exactly the, you know, the amount. But again, it's, it, it is a kind of distance function, you would say. There's, some of it's distance, some of it's not. I mean, actually, it turns out money moves more quickly between Boston and New York than between Boston and some local cities. And that's just because it's like shuttle flights, right? It's because they're moving money rapidly, you know, kind of steadily, in a, in a very, um, very frequently. Um, so, so this is the network system. So when I talk about New York as being, if I'm going back, uh, nope, wrong place. Uh, so when I say New York is the, you know, is the central node, um, but it subjects this sparse network subjects the entire banking system to very obvious systemic risk, which is that if the New York, if there's a panic that causes the collapse or temporary s sort of suspension of banking activities in New York, the entire banking system comes crashing down. This is a kind of liquidity crisis. That banks are unable, it's not just they can't get their reserve funds, you literally can't move money between banks. And in reality, um, the way that banks fund their outlays, that is when people come withdraw funds or they write checks on their accounts, the way these are funded is not really through the reserves that they hold, but it's through their cash flow. So if, if there is no cash flow, right, Banks are, you know, they're going to stop making payments because they're not receiving any inflows. And as they stop making payments, then other banks are not getting payments, and so they're going to stop making payments. And you can see this cascades very quickly into this systemic collapse. Let me just say, you know, again, we've experienced something like this very recently. Um, but there is an interesting episode, and it's a kind of lesson that I think we actually um, we want to tell for this similar uh, case. There was an incident like this in 9-11 because the central uh, computer architecture that moves money through the Federal Reserve System today was located under the World Trade Center. And when the Trade Center came crashing down, that entire, you know, kind of computer system, that network obviously collapsed. And of course that threatened exactly like New York. It's like bringing the New York banks down in 1907. Basically it just, you know, hemorrhages the entire interbank system. Now, of course, we actually had a central bank yeah, in 9-11, and so what the Fed did was it just flooded all the banks with liquidity. And so if you actually go and look at 
you know, bank statistics, you can get this data from the Fed Reserve site or, you know, I don't know if you know, I mean, if you go to St. Louis Fed has a site called FRED, right? So if you go to the FRED site, you know, you can pull up this data on reserves. You'll see, you know, I, th I was actually doing a, uh, a PowerPoint for my class and I was mapping out, you know, what was happening to excess reserves. I wanted to show everyone that there's just precious little ex excess reserves in the system. And there was this huge outlier right in the data. And I thought, well, surely I had made a mistake. Or the Fed had a mistake in the data you know, source, so I went back and I looked. As I honed into the date, I saw that date was, of course, September 2001. And then when I looked a little bit further, one of our co-authors in some of our work, Jamie McAndrews, who is the head of research division at the New York Fed, had a couple of papers explaining how it is that the Fed injected this huge amount of reserves, kind of preemptive measure to uh, enable banks to fund their outpayments, right, because the system had so, so that's the problem. This is really part, you might think of this, this is a problem of having, it's not, the Fed is not immune to this problem, but it's certainly a problem of a private system, is that when the entire banking system and therefore monetary flows in any private economy are tied to the private sector, then you do have to worry uh, that there may be problems of systemic risk, uh, it's kind of characterized as too interconnected to fail. This might cause the system to come crashing down. And ultimately, what's the, the factor that really per, uh, precipitates this crisis is, you know, is really a problem of regulation, not unlike 2008. Um, so you have in the United States, again, one of its unusual features, multiple jurisdictions for regulating banks and financial markets. You know, banks tend to exploit those, the differences between, you know, they play a game oftentimes finding you know, what's the regulator that will regulate us least, right? That was actually an issue that came up with the mortgage originators, you know, in the 2008 crisis. They wanted to escape, actually, federal regulation, and so they tried to, you know, kind of reorganize themselves so they could be subject to state government regulation, and then they move back and forth. It depends. Um, so here we have these shadow banks. These are trust companies. So trust companies typically hold, you know, lots of, you know, it's sort of private banking today, I guess. They're holding, you know, the deposits or the wealth of very, you know, very high net worth individuals. And then they're putting these monies, they typically would hold them, you know, in bonds and other kind of secure assets. But increasingly, these, these trust companies start behaving like commercial banks, taking in deposits and making loans. Um, but they were regulated under weaker state government regulations. And so when the bank runs hit, you know, they were more vulnerable um, to that. So, oh goodness, I'm not very, yes, i got to figure out, this is, this is trying, I mean, it's sort of, it's probably my problem playing tennis, actually, I don't something, you know, it's a coordination issue here. Um, all right, so let's, let's see if we can do this, manage this. Okay, um, so again, to understand, you know, this, 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 uh, our episode here, you have to know, first of all, uh, again, the U.S. has this tradition of local unit banking. So this is really a lot about states' rights. Uh, so those of you who have suffered through my lectures on this, you'll see this is about state sovereignty over the money supply. And it goes, this is really, it's, it goes back to the colonial era. And so it continues, it continues in a slightly different form back in, you know, in the pre-Constitution period. State governments could print their own money. So they lost that authority under the Constitution. But what they got was, in fact, sort of regulatory authority over the banks. And they were actually able to exercise their regulated regulatory authority over the banks to effectively control money supply, you know, within their jurisdictions. By 1907, there are 21,000 banks in the country. Most of these are unit banks. They have one office. Most are located in peripheral regions, highly specialized, at largely agricultural mining sector. Um, so, uh, again, they're integrated through this hierarchical network of correspondence centered in, you know, regional, these regional centers in New York. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so I don't need to go over that. There it is. Um, so here, okay, so this is the, again, this is the, you know, exotica of this lecture, which is the domestic exchange market. So in a private banking system, and again, this is an interesting, this is a point that, you know, I, we talked to McAndrews a lot about, is what would a purely private kind of payment system, monetary system, look like? where you don't have a central bank that is essentially moving money around the country um, you know, in a seamless and looks like it's a costless manner. So 
to move money from you know banks in one location to another, what you're literally doing is, again, as I said, you're moving money between their bank accounts in New York. But sometimes you might want to have that money back at home. So there's also, you've got money in New York, you've got money at home. And what this sets up is that there is actually something called the domestic exchange market. So if you're a banker in Chicago, that's our example, and you've got, so let's say, you have customers that want to make payments outside of your region, they need New York money. So how do they get New York money? And the answer is two. You can either literally go to the New York bank, take the money out, and ship it home, which you might imagine is costly and risky. Or you could see if any of your neighbor banks have excess funds in New York that they'd be willing to sell to you. And so what emerges in all these regional centers are what we call domestic exchange markets, in which literally banks are buying and selling deposits in New York. And that's how they're managing their reserves locally for local transactions or regional transactions, and how they're managing you know, reserves in New York, which they use for interregional transactions of their bank customers. Now, because the United States is a common currency, a common monetary region, and in particular is a common unit of account, uh, at least parity, right, the sort of fixed exchange rate between Chicago money, Chicago bank money, and New York bank money is a dollar for a dollar. Ideally, you know, everybody's on the same monetary unit. Those units all exchange for, you know, good funds for uh, official money at a rate of one to one. But actually rates could fluctuate. And the reason why, it's sort of a typical arbitrage kind of condition, you know, sometimes there's excess demands for funds in New York, so you expect a, then a premium on New York money. A premium can only go so high, because at some point, you know, you're more than happy just to ship the money, right? And likewise, when you're selling, you know, the premium can go only so, I mean, the discount can only go so low for the obvious reason. Uh, so we actually then go to uh, all this, these exchange rates are actually reported in newspapers of all, in all major regional centers. And you'll see, they will tell you, that, uh, you can't really read this, and I really can't read, but this is actually in dollars. These are dollars per thousand dollars worth of New York funds. So this is two, and this is around two. So we're talking about two dollars per thousand are, is the range of fluctuation. Just pretty relatively low. We're, you know, so this is like fractions of a percentage point deviation, and that's again a sense of how efficiently the system moves money. Because you can see that these bounds are determined by the transactions cost of moving money across space, because right? that's the arbitrage point where you're either willing, you're literally willing, to move the funds that yourself to actually ship them, or whether you're just you're going to buy or sell locally. So you're really saying that, in fact, you know, you're really moving, you know, it's only about a one, you know, less than one percentage point, you know, either premium or discount um, for funds in New York. During normal times when banks are willing to redeem deposits for official money, you know, at par one for one. And one other thing you can also see, this is around 1890, this is 1890s, this is after the 1893 panic. There's actually a significant decline in what looks like the, these bounds. So that, in fact, it looks like the system became even more efficient. This was actually associated with the further centralization of, of the interbank transactions in New York City. Um, by the way, this is San Francisco, just so you ask. So you can see, so San Francisco is uh, something of an exception. So we're talking, I've got to see, this is, this is five. So this is about, you know, this is like a half uh, point oh, point five percent, right? Um, so again, compared to, you know, it's like two and a half times, you know, the, the size of the magnitude of, of Chicago, places like Chicago, Boston, it's even less. It's, this is one, so Boston is very efficient moving money. Yeah. Was it possible for there to be panics during negative like, one of the Oh, we erase movies? all the panics. I have to show you. This is, I'm oh. sorry, I should mention, there are no panics. I mean, we've, I, we've taken all the panic episodes out of this. Oh, okay. Okay, now again, because in panic episodes, um, and I'll explain why, and I'll show you what, what this looks like during a panic period. So let me again, just the background of panic. Um, so again, this run on the trust, uh, Knickerbocker Trust. So what's interesting about Knickerbocker, this is just, there's sort of the myths of history. Um, I don't get it, I'm not, you may have heard about this, this instance, because 
it seemed to have some parallel between the role that J.P. Morgan Chase played in 2008. So Knickerbocker uh, actually was a solvent bank. There were concerns about its solvency. This led to runs. It literally paid out one day, paid out $3 million worth of cash, which I guess back then was quite a bit of money. And then at that point, you know, its coffers ran dry, and the next day it just closed its doors. Now, banks had had a habit of helping each other under dire times like this. They, in fact, performed de facto function of lender of last resort to each other. But they decided not to help out Knickerbocker in this case. Uh, and there's a whole you know, question, I mean, J.P. Morgan plays an integral role in this decision, but there was some view that Knickerbocker was tainted by all the speculation. There was a belief that it was insolvent, and so, again, they were unprepared since, again, all they were willing to do was help out liquid banks. I mean, banks that are liquid but not insolvent. Um, so they're denied assistance. They close their doors. And once they do that, all of a sudden you see a run on pretty much every trust company and bank in New York. So this was actually a mistake. This is a little bit like letting Lehman Brothers collapse. Right? So I don't think they realize the consequences, the systemic reactions that would occur because of this. Let me just say that there's some question about whether there's some conflicts of interest that, it, that the, you know, the nominal reason that Morgan and, 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 and friends give for not helping out Knickerbocker was that they believed it was insolvent, um, but there are also some striking conflicts of interest Partly because, again, the trust companies were encroaching on the business of commercial banks. It was also the case, a colleague of mine, Eric Hilt, has shown that, that uh, Knickerbocker was actually uh, was involved, its trust company, in funding certain you know, industrial enterprises that were competing with Morgan Enterprises. So that was also a potential conflict of interest. So this is, by the way, so you have to have the pictures. So this, is, this is the bank run. This is the fo folks lining up at the door in Knickerbocker as they've closed their doors and no longer dishing out the money. Um, okay, uh, so again, after Knickerbocker, um, again, you see runs on other banks. Trust Company of America is the next bank to get these runs. And, and then Morgan and friends change their mind and decide they're going to start bailing out everybody. But by that time, you know, the horse is out of the barn or whatever other analogy you want to, you know, metaphor you want to use, and the panic results. So during panic periods, uh, these clearinghouse associations, which again are really these joint venture arrangements among banks, they kind of are, you could think of them a little bit like a cartel that kind of manages the banking system. Probably not an inappropriate um, analogy. Uh, to help banks in, you know, in response to runs, they, what they call suspend payments. Now that's an it, unusual, what they do are restricting convertibility of deposits, right? So instead of closing their doors entirely and saying, I'm sorry, you can't get your funds, they say to their customers, you know, you can only withdraw certain amounts of money, you know, on this frequency. So you can see actually in numerous newspaper articles, it's kind of clearly laid out, you know, you can only take out 10, 15, 25 dollars a day. You cannot drain your account, right? That's one of the key, you know, kind of uh, restrictions. And so, of course, what this means, and again, the reason why bank deposits today are, you know, almost a perfect substitute for official money is because we always believe we can go to the bank and get that money, that it's a perfect substitute for official money, which is just, think about the cash in our wallets, right? So, under normal circumstances, you know, again, bank money would have been, again, almost a perfect substitute for your official money. But during these periods, there's a supply restriction, right? So, it turns out... We expect to see then, right, instead of, you know, a kind of margin wa open up between the value of bank money and the value of official money because they're no longer, you know, trading seamlessly one for one. Banks are no, well, no longer willing to be market makers, willing to buy, you know, and sell deposits dollar for dollar with respect to official money. So the other thing that, that banks, the clearinghouses do is they issue emergency currency, <coughs> right? And so this is, uh, this currency is, it's again, it's just like discount window lending. And in this case with the New York clearinghouse, this is large value currency, large denomination, tens of thousands of dollars. So again, um, member banks could go to the clearinghouse, they could pledge good assets, they could then borrow these funds. And what this gave them was additional reserves they could use to discharge 
their obligations to other banks. And this enabled them to conserve their cash so they can meet their depositors' withdrawals. So what you have then, again, two responses. This, you can think of this as the private monetary policy response to a bank run. Suspension, so that's a way of restricting the outflow of cash, but also this currency, emergency currency issue, which enables banks to economize on their, on their currency, which they can use to meet outside depositors. So just for the record, this is a picture. This is of you know San Francisco clearinghouse money. This is a, looks like this ten thousand dollar denomination. Um, uh, and so again, when I talk about there's a kind of dual monetary system emerging. So instead of selling one for one, you know there are two ways you could look at this. Uh, it's actually in the newspaper accounts. It's referred to as a currency premium. And what this is is. This is the price of gold, coins, official money, in terms of bank deposits. So instead of one for one, in New York at, you know, and this again going from October, which is approximately when the, the crisis starts, it's sort of the end of October and continues until uh, the end of December. So you can see, you know, that uh, there's a premium $25. Right. Going all the way up to a little bit over $35, New York fund. Um, that's the currency premium in New York. We have less frequent data. This is Chicago. Notice they're roughly, and there's no reason to think that they would be all that different, to be honest. I mean, they're roughly the same, actually. So this, by the way, happens pretty much you know, in, in almost every, uh, every region. Uh, oh, sorry. So following the bank suspension in New York, within a week, you get bank suspensions in 25 regional and local centers, which is what you'd expect. Once the central node goes down, all the other nodes fall down with it. So that's the systemic part. Now, what's interesting about these other uh, clearing houses is they follow New York in issuing these large denomination certificates. And this I really find, this is one of the most interesting, and I think this is really key to understanding about the origins of the Fed. But they also issue, many of them, small denomination certificates. That is in denominations of a dollar, five dollars, and so forth. And of course, this is not for interbank transactions. These are not large value, you know, funds transfers between banks. This is one of this, again, our friend, the San Francisco Clearinghouse, one dollar. You know, it looks surprising like, like a piece of currency. And that's because they are paying these out to their depositors. So if we step back for one second, now notice again, they're using, again, a bank which, which needs funds to pay, you know, cash to pay its depositors goes to the clearinghouse and says, look, we've got all these very good assets, but we just lack cash. We're illiquid, but we're basically solvent. So we're going to pledge these assets. We want to then borrow money, and we want this money in these small denominations so we can pay our customers. Has no more backing and no more legitimacy than the authority of the banking system in San Francisco. And what is really amazing to me is that customers just take this stuff, and they spend it. And the stores that they buy this stuff at, they accept it, and they deposit it in their banks, and you know it just works, you know. So when we step back and we say to ourselves, you know, why does money work? And I still have students that still think that there's some gold in some place that is backing the money supply, and you say, no, it's really just. We think of it general acceptability. It's just if folks accept it generally, that it works. And why will they accept it? We tend to think, well, there's something about they trust. They just think that. Again, if I accept this, the next person's going to accept it. This is a kind of network effect as well, right? If everybody in our local network just takes this stuff, you know, we can just print it and it'll just circulate as currency. And it does, actually. It's amazing because in 1893, there's something called a cash famine. Literally, there was not enough currency to go around. Nobody except a few clearinghouses in the South were issuing the small denomination stuff. And it got so severe that businesses had to close their doors because they could not make their payrolls. Because at the time, most workers didn't have bank accounts. So you couldn't pay them with a check. You had to pay them in cash. If you didn't have the cash, you couldn't pay them. If you can't pay them, you can't hire them. So you actually have a rash of unemployment in 1893 downturn simply because there's not enough cash to go around. So banks learned their lesson, and they realized, well, we'll guess print some cash ourselves and we'll circulate it. And it works well, except one problem. Right? Notice the large denomination clearing stuff. The large denomination money only circulates in the clearinghouse between the banks. 
this stuff can't really circulate outside of the new of the San Francisco region because you might trust it because you live in San Francisco and you know the bankers or whatever but there's no reason to believe this is going to you know actually sell for anything in Los Angeles let alone Chicago or New York so unlike a national money right what we actually have is the fragmentation of the country now into regional monetary kind of unions and if you think about this, this was actually back to the future. This was exactly what the United States looked like before the Civil War. So, I mean, the bottom line is this system of a purely private interbank network without a central bank as a backstop, right, with a weak and fragmented regulatory system was very vulnerable to this. And again, this, the monetary union in the United States it turned out everyone thought it was very enduring, and it turned out to be actually, in retrospect, quite fragile. And so again, this is a slightly different view about the origins of the Fed, that the Fed is sort of founded in part as a kind of as the bulwark of the monetary union necessary to secure that. So just what I said, uh, said the same thing, actually. So, um, so again, I just uh, again, this is the fragmentation part, and what you can see is again, you see all these, you know, these exchange rates. This is normal times. This is the, you know, again, the fluctuation and domestic exchange rates under normalcy. This is now the panic, and you go back to normalcy eventually. And so, it's a little bit like if those of you've ever studied the gold standard is just, you know, international money and finance. Same thing happened in the gold standard every once in a while. You know, countries would peg their currencies to gold, so that's a fixed exchange rate system, fixed parities. You get deviations from parities basically along the same lines. And then every once in a while, because of a war or a kind of severe recession, banks would go off, I mean, countries would go off the gold standard. You see something that looks like this. Um, so. So what happens when the banking system and the monetary system fragments? And so, again, a little bit like 93, we argue that this fragmentation actually results in, doesn't cause business cycle contractions, it just reinforces existing contractions. So actually, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz notoriously argue that, you know, we would have been better off without the Fed in the 1930s. Better yet, we should have let the banks, you know, without the Fed, they just should have suspended just like they did back in 1907. And so we say, well, maybe not so fast. Okay, so let me just show you. This is the kind of exercise. So we have a paper that looks at this. It's so sort of the real side of this banking panic. To show, this is the, by the way, this is now on the Main Street. Main Street shows up here. So what happens, this is, the, you know, again, this is the panic hits. This is industrial production. So, I'm sorry, no, this is the panic, actually. Notice the economy was in a contraction before the panic. It's not uncommon, actually. So we're not trying to explain the turning points of the business cycle. Right? We think that that's, you know, there's some other, you know, some other factors that are causing cyclical fluctuations. All we're trying to argue is that the economy contracts more rapidly, more steeply, and it stays in the downturn longer than it would have otherwise if there had not been this monetary fragility, banking system fragility. So essentially, our econometric analysis is nothing more, to be perfectly honest, <coughs> than what I did here with Excel. And this is all done, by the way, this is done scientifically by just taking a little line and kind of just. So what I've done, I mean, all we've done is said, let, let's look at the trend of contraction prior to the suspension of payments. And we're going to essentially assume, and this is really a kind of, again, it's an empirical model. We're just going to assume that the economy would have continued contracting at the same rate, right, because of whatever factors that were causing this turning point to begin. Then suspension hits, and what we discover is no, actually, it's, it, it actually drops even more rapidly. It falls a bit farther than it might have otherwise, and it takes a little bit longer to recover. So we estimate that actually this represents a 10, 10 to 20 percent greater decline in real GDP, or at least real industrial production, than would have otherwise occurred in the absence of this. So if you want to try to get an estimate of what it cost to have this kind of banking system, we say that's you know one way of gauging <coughs> gauging this. And so you know we actually have this this analysis not just tonight, it goes back to 1873. We're able to do it for a variety of various indices. Again, the reason why we use industrial production, by the way, is because there is no GDP estimate uh, for this period. Anything that's really so this is the closest we can have to some measure of aggregate economic activity. The only other possibility, and I actually done this. This is bank clearing data. <coughs> 
and this is done at the regional level. So bank clearing is literally the movement of, you know, of, of bank deposits and the turnover of bank deposits in response to, you know, transactions. In every place except for New York, the clearing data tends to be a fairly decent index of regional economic activity. New York, the trouble is the financial sector. is too much financial sector transaction that kind of skews the clearing data. So this is an example from 1907. Again, you can see the downward trend. So again, this is an estimated, this, by the way, is not my simple, you know, this is actually estimated trend line decline, you know, based on before and after. And this is the, um, the crisis period, the suspension period. So what, you know, again, we're arguing is that you're on this trend line and then suspension hits and then you're basically still roughly on the trend line, but you drop down. Again, it's 10, 20 percentage points, again, depending on the various locations. Um, and you can see the same pattern. This is, I guess, Chicago. You see the same thing going on in Boston, the same, you know, it's a little bit harder in, in uh, St. Louis just because the magnitudes are, are a little bit lower. All right. Um, by the way, we also test, because there's one argument that this is a consequence of bank failures and bank failures precipitating bank runs. And we find that actually it's the suspension rather than the bank failures that have the largest effect. So with that in mind, we say, you know, why the central bank? And uh, so again, this is just, you know, in part it's a re repetition of some of what I've just said, is that really they're just responding to what is this complete fragmentation of the banking and monetary system that follows the 1907 panics. Now again, let me just emphasize that, you know, there is a monetary or there are monetary authorities during this period. And so let me just again emphasize that you see on the private side considerable monetary intervention. So Morgan and Friends bailing out banks. It's again not unlike the private bailouts that were arranged through the Fed. You know, the Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase buying up sort of troubled troubled banks or investment banks. And there's also this complementary monetary policy of the clearing houses. Now, what is really astonishing is this funny money that they're printing up. They print up an aggregate. We asked, you know, this is estimated, actually, as a, an economist at the time who sent out surveys to the clearing houses to get some sense of how much, you know, large and small denomination currency that they're issuing. And in totals, it's about a half a billion dollars. This is about a third of the money supply. So this is not a small amount of funds. This is a huge monetary intervention. Again, orchestrated largely privately. So there's this private side. Again, I want to emphasize the Treasury is at the same time operating like a central bank as well. Right? So you might think of this as we talk about an independent central bank. Well, this is not an, the opposite. This is a dependent central bank because it's the Treasury, which is part of the executive branch, but it's actually exercising monetary authority. Um, so one of the things is that this is the part, you know, so everyone tends to focus on, and you actually see this today, by the way, when J.P. Morgan Chase, they bailed out, what did they bail out, Morgan's, what did they buy, Bear not Morgan Stearns, Bear Stearns, right. So they bailed out Bear Stearns, and everyone said, oh, look back, and then in 1907, J.P. Morgan Chase, and he bailed out, you know, the banks too, right. Of course, what they forgot to tell you is that he, they didn't bail out Knickerbocker, which is what caused the problem um, to begin with. <laughs> but what they also don't tell you is that the New York, I mean, the, the Treasury basically, pushed tons, I mean, all their gold from all of their reserves in Washington, and they put it in New York, and they said to the New York banks, lend the money, and if you need liquidity, you'll just come to this, what's called the sub-treasury. That was the treasury warehouse, essentially, in New York City. And you will lend you, we'll lend you the liquidity that you might need because you basically are using your funds to bail out these other banks. So in a sense, the <coughs> backstop liquidity, which is what the Fed did in 9-11, Right, that backstop liquidity facility is being supplied by the Treasury, which is what enabled the private banks to essentially underwrite uh, the bailout of uh, their uh, compromised uh, uh, peers. The other thing they do is they relax regulations on banks, um, which enable banks to, for example, all that money creation, especially small denomination currency, completely illegal, actually. Uh, right? But the Treasury understood that if they enforced the law, that that would actually reinforce the mag, you know, the contraction, and so they essentially, it's like regulatory forbearance, right? And the same thing was true, to, you know, back in 2008, probably virtually every bank, I think it's estimated, was insolvent. And if if the Fed, you know, the Treasury, the Office of Control of the Currency, state banking departments, if they had really wanted to, 
they could have pretty much closed down the entire banking system. But they chose not to. And again, that was the goal, was to try to restore the solvency of the banking system, which they do. Um, so here, again, we take on Friedman and Schwartz. Uh, we think, you know, they argued that uh, the Friedman Schwartz actually argue in, the, in their great, I mean, their kind of treatise, you know, Monetary History of the United States, was that, you know, the only reform that was actually needed in 1907 was to legitimize or institutionalize the emergency currency. Aldrich Vreeland Act, the one that actually creates this commission to study the formation of a central bank, also authorizes something called emergency currency, was exactly this institutionalization of, uh, of the clearinghouse practice. And, um, oops, that's done too fast on the draw. So in 1914, actually, is the only episode, so this is a, there's a preempted panic in 1914 around, again, it's, it's World War I is the precipitating event. And Aldrich Vreeland is actually called out in a preemptive manner um, to shore up the liquidity of the banking system. The problem here is that um, basically European wealth holders are liquidating their asset holdings in New York, especially in the stock market. Um, this causes enormous gold drain that concerns the Treasury because that will have a contractionary monetary policy effect. So McAdoo, Secretary of Treasury, sort of says, and Wall Street agrees, he said, we want to close down the New York Stock Exchange. The problem is closing down the New York Stock Exchange is that banks tended to hold their excess reserves in loans to New York stock brokers. And again, they do that with the expectation, these are overnight loans, they expect to be able to get the money back very quickly. But if you close down the stock exchange, then of course the brokers are illiquid, they can't pay off their loans, the banks become illiquid. So that's exactly what happened. That's why you call out the guards, the 19, you know, and you use the Aldrich Freeland Act. Um, but actually, in this case, it's not, you know, what the, the, the Treasury is doing in 1914 is exactly what the Fed did in 1911. They actually engage in a preemptive monetary intervention, acting, you know, not like what's the Aldrich Freeland Act itself, but really acting like a central bank. So the lesson of 1914 is really that you need a central bank that can act decisively and preemptively, if possible. And of course, this condition, decisively is important, preemptively is difficult. And by the way, the transcripts that were just released of the Open Market Committee's you know, meetings during the 2008 crisis tell us very clearly that they were certainly not decisive in this. They were not preemptive, obviously. They were not preemptive. Actually, many of them would not have been even decisive, but Janet Yellen was. Um, so that means basically they didn't really know what was going on. And this isn't generally the problem, you know, with a severe crisis, is that you don't know your, you know, that there's a severe crisis until you're in the midst, and by the time you're in the midst, it's a little bit too late. The question is whether you can then act decisively once you discover that. And that's exactly what happens. That's what the Fed does, 9-11. It's what, well, actually, well, that it knew right away there was a problem. 2008, that's really, I give Bernanke a lot of credit for that. That's what's different between, by the way, 2008 and 1930. In 1930, they also had, they really were unsure what was going on. They tried a bunch of conventional methods. They didn't work, and they just tried a bunch more conventional methods, right? So that's the myopia. That's, and in some ways, many think of them as being a slave to the gold standard back then. They just could not, until the very end, they could not relinquish, relinquish their commitment to the orthodoxy. By the way, that's a famous line in Keynes about, you know, about a, you know, that somehow policymakers are slaves to these, you know, dead economists. That's, that's, what, that's a reference to. Uh, so, God forbid, we should be slaves to dead economists. Um, so, uh, again, it's this decisive action. And, again, we see the Treasury actually acting quite decisively like a central bank. And so the bottom line is you want these central banks because they have to be able to really act in this fashion. And also, one other factor I do think is important, it's, you know, the Fed's not immune to conflicts of interest, but this, the problem of all these bank panics, they are rife with con conflicts of interest. And again, it's what prevents the private sector side from oftentimes intervening effectively um, during the crisis moments. So I think that is the end of the show. Yes. So, so any questions? Uh, Yeah, yeah.
you said uh, other countries had stopped having uh, like all these financial crises yeah. and bank runs by the 1870s. Why was that? They had central banks. Oh, okay. So that's, I mean, the sort of simple answer is that they do have, again, some kind of centralized. They have a slightly different style of central banking, but, you know, I mean, um, so I don't know if any of you have been down to the, this is a somewhat obscure reference, the Jewish, the Jewish Museum on Fifth Avenue. Sort of ever seen that build? That's actually Jake. That's Paul Warburg's mansion. So Paul Warburg is an investment banker. Comes from a you know kind of lofty line of German banking banking family, and he comes from this a German tradition where there is a central bank. There's a certain style of central banking. He comes to the United States and he's just astonished at what it looks like a very primitive kind of um, you know banking system. And he also just can't understand how the American public endures these you know frequent banking panics. Um, and so, you know, this is a very famous incident about, this is again, this Aldrich Vreeland Commission and ultimately the drafting of the Federal Reserve Act is that they, you know, there's this uh, clandestine trip to Jekyll's Island, which is, if you've ever been there, it's a beautiful island, actually. I, I, all these wonderful states, Rockefeller and Morgan, you know, I actually went camping there, so I'm not, you know, so just to, <laughs> just to be clear, I was actually, I had the low road um, to uh, Jekyll's Island. But they went down to Jekyll's Island and there they drafted the blueprint for the Fed. And it was revised a bit because of some differences between the kind of Republican, more centralized, Democratic, more decentralized you know, organization of the Fed. But Warburg was the fundamental. They, people tend to think of this as really his, his blueprint. And again, he's coming from a tradition you know, where there is central banking throughout, you know, throughout co especially continental Europe. And well, the Bank of England is by this time a central bank as well. So, yeah. Looking at the correspondence banking system you talked about, uh, yeah. except for New York, were there cases where there were just regionalized banking panics, so that you know, in San Francisco yeah, they were panicked yeah. but not spread out? Around. Well, they start off that. I mean, so um, well, that's a good question. I can't speak, you know, definitively about that. I mean, the one place where we see, so again, this 1893 episode is interesting, um, in that you see the crisis. It's let me just say that that the reason why that's a little unusual relative to these rich man's panics is because this is really represents the kind of tail end of the railroad biz the railroad kind of driven business cycle. And you would expect to see then when the railroads begin to lose steam, that railroad investment, it would be in these newer areas in the West and the South. Right? And so those are the ones that would be most sort of like the, it's not unlike the housing boom, right? You sort of saw this in kind of these boom areas, Las Vegas or parts of, you know, Florida or California. So there's where you see the crisis er erupting in 1993 and, and local bank panics. And so it seems to be isolated events until enough of these panics occur, these local panics, and then you start to see huge withdrawals of the funds from New York in response to that. And then it becomes a national crisis. Right. So at least there's a timing difference, you know, and, and part of, um, you know, again, the research, and again, this is a, a bit painstaking. Um, economists make a big deal when they sort of say, oh, we have hand collected data. And I think to myself, you know, I've been hand collecting data all my academic life, but it's now only become kind of, kind of cachet, I think, or, you know, a certain cachet in the economics profession. But, you know, all we can really do is we look at newspapers and we try to see the timing. And one of the key things I wanted to argue was that, again, the timing of the regional suspensions relative to New York suspension, right? So if you try to track that, you know, and this, it turns out not very easy to do uh, in the earlier periods, but what we can see is you can sort of, sort of the New York panic uh, suspension in 1893 is not until August, but May and June is when you begin to see problems in Denver and, and uh, Kansas City, uh, San Francisco, and other locations like that. So a couple of months, and then it, with a lag, it hits New York. As opposed to 1907, hits New York within a week. It's pretty much spread in almost every place except for the South. And the one reason why the South is exceptional is because it has a ready line to liquidity by selling its cotton, you know, in uh, in uh, European markets. Yeah. If the South had so much liquidity, why did they not appeal to the South, like uh, to inject liquidity into the system? So. Uh, Again, the mechanisms for moving money around, I mean, so, again, the thing is that that's the localized nature of the monetary right. intervention, right? right? You see, that's the problem, is that today, I mean, the Fed today, that's what the Fed can do. 
right? So one of the goals of the Federal Reserve was to take all of the reserves that banks are holding all over the place and centralize them, right? right? And so that way, I mean, it both, it dramatically reduces the cost of transferring money between banks, but it also ena enables the Fed to act as essentially a unified front. Now let me just say, in 1930, the Fed was not a unified front. So this is the problem, again, the United States system, a little bit unusual, is that when initially you know, constructed, and Warburg was very clear about this, and especially because he was Jewish, and because there was a great deal of resistance to financial centralization, and because of anti-Semitism, it was always viewed as a Jewish conspiracy. So he sort of argued that you, know, you can't have, I mean, you can't adopt European-style central banking, which is truly centralized. So every regional reserve bank was able to conduct its own monetary operations up until 1935. And that actually didn't prove to be very effective because sometimes the banks, the regional banks could operate across purposes. So when the New York Reserve Bank wants to conduct an expansionary open market policy in the early 1930s because it sees the pressure of the banking system, Boston and Chicago and San Francisco say no. And they actually pursue contraction in three Right. essentially neutralizing what the New York Fed is. And eventually New York runs out of money. I mean, it literally it has its own gold account. It can only issue liabilities twice the amount of gold it has in its account, which is, again, how it conducts its monetary operations. And then eventually it has to stop because, you know, the gold is someplace else. So 1935, we realize you have to have a centralized open market committee that's conducting monetary operations for the entire country. And so the modern day Board of Governors and Open Market Committee is what we're talking about about twenty years after the founding, two decades. Yeah. yeah. Were well, these um clearing houses privately organized or they Yeah, they're private joint venture. Okay. Actually, you know, it turns out um, some there is something called the clearing house. If you Google today you used to do a search, the clearing house. So that's uh, it still continues. The clearing house is the successor uh, to the New York Clearinghouse Association. Um, you know, the Fed effectively natu nationalizes much of what the New York Clearinghouse did. So the, the Clearinghouse had to figure out something else to do. And, and what it does do, the Fed's jurisdiction stops at the U.S. border. So international payments requires a different clearing mechanism. And so the Clearinghouse increasingly moved into international payments. And today it's actually moving into digital, you know, digital money transactions. So you see, you know, these online bank networks, some of them are operated by the Fed, the clearinghouse is doing a bit of that as well. And I will say that, um, so I happen to be doing research in those archives, um, and they were thinking of moving their archives, because uh, it's essentially moving a lot of back office stuff into some god forsaken place in North Carolina, which if you live in North Carolina, I, I, there are many nice places there. No, but it would just be out of the reach of researchers, right? In New York, you know, a lot of colleagues come to New York just to use these clearinghouse archives for their study of the banking system, because it is so important. So essentially, this is again, so I'm going to make a reference to an old movie, because I'm an old guy, so anyway, so Raiders of the Lost Ark won, right? <laughs> and, and, uh, so this is when they get the Ark, and they sort of, and it goes into the uh, government repository, and they put it in some crate, and they throw it off in some location, and you realize, there it is, the Holy Grail is lost forever, because it's in, and that's, uh, she, you know, she was afraid that that's exactly what would happen to these archives. So she walks up to me, because I happen to be the only researcher in the room, and she said, do you think your institution would like to have these archives? And I said, sure, of course we would. You know, so basically, a large portion of these archives are now in the Rare Books Library at, uh, at Columbia. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so I like to think of myself, because again, I know, actually, it turns out the Boston Clearinghouse was taken over by the Boston Federal Reserve Bank. And when I contacted the archivist there, she said, I asked her about this. She said, she said you know, she said, it's funny, because there's a room in the basement that says Boston Clearinghouse. And I really never knew what that was about. You know? So there was this guy, apparently, who went to this room like every day, and like no one knew what he was, you know, it was just like, it's like some relic, I mean, I don't know, like leftover from 1907, I mean, so, and she said, well, what they wound up, she investigated this for me a bit, she said, you know what happened, and this is, this is Raiders of the Lost Ark, she said, well, we, we moved all of our archives off site, and I was checking the records for this one, and we have no record of where they, where they are, so, again, the Boston Clearinghouse being an interesting case of a regional clearinghouse that was tied very closely to New York, and so those records were lost. So, um, but the clearinghouse is alive and alive and well. Um, yeah. 
a question more pointing kind of toward maybe the future. Yeah. It's the idea like uh, you said that uh, the central bank like the Fed can act as a liquidity provider in time of crisis, and but they couldn't do it in OA just because a lot of the investment banks that were failing, uh, I don't think the Fed could lend directly to. Well, them. it did do that though. You see, that's well, again that's a regulatory forbearance. It said basically every investment bank turned into a commercial bank overnight. Right, because of the bank holding costs, right? Right, and, exactly. But then what about, like, the, I think a lot of people are talking about the hedge fund now uh, industry taking more and more risk and doing the activities that banks used to do. Right, no, that's actually, that is a part of the shadow sure. banking and the investment yeah. banks. I mean, Lehman was doing the same thing. I actually looked at, um, so this was interesting. Again, I was sort of, a lot of what I know about this is from teaching. And so when I looked at the Lehman brother balance sheet. It showed up briefly, you know, before it went bankrupt, the SEC site no longer has it up there anymore. But, <laughs> but you could see they were borrowing overnight. Uh, so again, that's equivalent to taking deposits. And then they had a bunch of risky assets on there. I mean, you can't imagine. I mean, actually, I had first-year students who recognized this to be a totally insane way to operate a bank. Um, and so, sure, I mean, that's partly why they didn't actually bail them out. Um, so again, this is a part of the problem is that, you know, the problem with Lehman is that the hedge funds, a lot of hedge funds were actually clearing their transactions through a Lehman branch in London. Yeah. Right. And the reason why they were doing that was because they didn't want domestic regulatory authorities to have any idea what they were doing. So this is the regulatory bypass that, you know, this is again. So in, in 1907, we're talking about you know multiple jurisdictions and fragmented regulation, but it's really in the context of a national economy. Today we're talking about the same thing, but obviously you know now we're talking about it more in a global context. So of course the Fed cannot see what's going on offshore, or it can only see what the Bank of England and, and the local supervisory um, you know councils there are telling them. So that's why they didn't realize the fallout that would occur because of uh, because of that. But notice, by the way, the Fed, this actually was in a New York Times article, was it yesterday? Again, with the transcripts coming out. Um, they taught a lot about the Fed's lending to other central banks. Right? So this was the Fed actually way extending its authority to act as a lender of last resort, not just to what had not been banks before, but actually outside of the future. And this was actually, they, they, they knew and they got a lot of criticism from Congress. They couldn't understand, you know, what are you doing? You know, you're an American institution. They should take care of themselves. But again, the dollar is the international currency, and the Fed had to support the dollar, not just as the domestic money, but as the international money. And it did, actually. And again, I mean, Bernanke gets a huge amount of credit for taking these rather bold steps, because again, we've seen, you know, evidence in the past where Again, conventional wisdom would have said, you know, otherwise, or at least risk aversion would have led them to take a more conservative stance. And uh, I think so. What we see is, did not, you know, they didn't see the bubble, although Yellen did, actually, to her credit, sort of saw the bubble um, before it burst, and and um, it didn't, and again, wasn't quite aware of the magnitude of the crisis. Because um, I can recall, I mean, I was literally on the beach. Literally on the beach, actually. In August '07, when they thought they had stopped the problem, then you know, through a pretty minor adjustment to the discount rate, right? And so I remember just the confidence in which he said, oh, "You know, don't worry, this will take care of it." Right? And that was a little bit like, you know, the, again, I could just see. I mean, writing the history, you'd have to say that just sounds like we're in 19, 1930 all over again in retrospect. Did many economists see it at back then? No, they didn't. No. they didn't. They didn't. They didn't. And then you know, and then again when. You see the problem with Bear Stearns, and you know at that point I, I must say I did call my father-in-law and I said get your money out of you know, you know, put it into money markets or something. But even that, so what's interesting about it is that the modern day panic today actually not just against Lehman but against money market funds, because it is very much like I mean the attitude towards money market funds today is very much like towards the trust companies, because um, and they were the ones you know and what the Fed did there was basically said we will. We will provide FDIC type insurance to money market funds, which itself is extraordinary powers rendered, you know, far beyond. I guess, you know, technically not beyond, you know, its its official jurisdiction, but it certainly was certainly unprecedented in recent history. So, so those are the lessons of history. I think my fear is actually that. Um, 
in many other regards, you know, we may have forgotten some of these some of these lessons. Um, and again, you worry a little bit about these these digital currencies or digital monies. We'll see. It's interesting. Again, this most recent incident where whatever some some guy runs off with the bitcoins. I guess I don't know exactly what's going on. I mean, but you know that. So one of these exchanges, you know, collapses, and what happens to you know the bitcoin money? I don't. You know, it's so to have monies like this without any regulation operating, you know. Na you know, not not just nationally. East nationally, you have some hope that there can be some ultimate regulation, sort of coherent regulation. But here, this is just seems you know, beyond detection. Um, 